Cable News Confidential about his misadventures in the corporate media. He worked at MSNBC, Fox, CNN, is the co-founder of FAIR, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with, but in case you're not, it's a website de dedicated to fairness and accuracy in reporting. Uh, he is the founding director of the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College, where he taught for 10 years. He's also been uh, in a lot of documentaries about, you guessed it, the media, uh, including Orwell Rolls in His Grave, Outfoxed, All Governments Lie, and he's in Bernie Blackout, which is premiering tomorrow on Vice. And I'm really excited to have him here today. So, Jeff, thanks so much for joining me. Great to be with you. So, what? Tell us about uh, how you got into uh, corporate media from Fair, and it has quite a dramatic ending. So, so t take us take us to that. Well, too. The beginning is sort of interesting because we set up Fair to talk about the big issues that the mainstream media were missing and the corporate bias, the pro-war bias. But after we started FAIR, and I was the executive director, so it was the whole reason for founding FAIR, the reason we started it was to take this critique of the corporate mainstream media into the mainstream media. Prior to FAIR, Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman had written some great books. Um, Alex Coburn, there are a few left-wing media critics who were quite good, but our job was to take, to popularize the progressive critique of mainstream media. So I would get these calls from television to discuss nudity and television, or um, is there too much swearing, oh, you know, God. like crazy issues that no matter what the issue was, I'd say yes. <laughs> so I started developing a mainstream TV profile. And then CNN starts paying me to come on their regular show called Reliable Sources, a weekly show. Uh, and then whenever there's a media, critic, a media controversy, Crossfire, which was their biggest show for decades, they would have me on as a guest. Um, and then I started getting paid. Uh, so CNN, I had a, a pretty good run at CNN. And then they were the only cable news channel. And then um, they tested me to be the co-host of Crossfire. And Crossfire was a program that FAIR had criticized the most. We'd run full page ads in USA Today attacking Crossfire on the basis that they never allowed uh, a true progressive to host. I'm also gonna have to inter interrupt you. They also didn't yeah. allow anybody to speak for more than seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a given. But you get good at the short sound bite, trust yeah. me. I became a specialist. You know, I would go in there uh, on the 30 minute show and it was, as I say, the biggest show on CNN. It would uh, compete with Larry King for which would be the highest ratings each night. And I would say to myself, if I could make these three points, that no one has ever made in corporate media before. This will be a success. Now, how do I compress each of those three points to 15 words each? But at any rate, uh, so we had always attacked Crossfire because well before there was a Fox News, um, CNN and PBS had pioneered in this phony left-right uh, conflict, which was always center and right. It would always be a vacillating corporate liberal who was baby step left of center against a far rightist. And that would be the way they constructed this corporate debate, this center right debate, this General Electric to General Motors debate, you know, GE to GM is what we call it. So at some point, the, the co-host the Crossfire left, Michael Kinsley, and we'd attacked him for years. For six years, he would say every night, I'm Michael Kinsley from the left. Uh, and after the six years, we got a Washington Post reporter to ask him, uh, you know, to define his own politics. And he said, oh, I'm a wishy-washy moderate. So that's yeah, who represented that's, that's the, the left. left. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's who was yeah. on the left. <laughs> right. And it happened on PBS. I mean, people, when Fox News started in like 97, um, they had a show called Hannity and Calms where this guy Combs was not telegetic, he was not articulate, and he was not progressive. And every night Hannity would, would eat him up. Yeah. And our joke about Hannity and Combs, and it's in my book, 
is Hannity and Combs. Combs was like the Washington Generals, the yes. team that was sent out every night to lose to the Harlem Globetrotters. And Combs was sent out every night by Fox News to lose to uh, Hannity. But the reality is that the center right spectrum had been enforced long before there was a Fox News. So I, I was tested to be a co-host from the left. And I got the word that what they were most concerned about is their sponsor. And, and you do a great job in Bernie Blackout talking about the, you know, media are owned by big corporations and they're sponsored by big corporations. Well, mm -hmm. the corporation that sponsored Crossfire was General Electric. And I was known as one of a, a leading General Electric critic. And so they were worried that I would attack the sponsor and they brought me into the boss's office. I said, look, I'm not going to go every night to try to figure out a way to attack General Electric. Uh, but if General Electric deserves attacking based on the topic that we're debating that night, of course I'm going to attack. And so how did they get around that, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I, they didn't hire me. Uh, you know, I, mean, I, I got I, tested. I was great. The TV critics thought I was great. I was young and handsome with jet black hair at the time and uh, more articulate and funnier and handsomer all the reasons you would choose someone for, you know, for TV, yeah. TV, but I had the wrong politics and they were worried I would be too critical of corporations. So that, that's sort of how my TV career started. And then Fox news started up and I gave them tapes, you know, it should be Hannity and Cohen. This is before they went on the air. Obviously they didn't want someone who would defeat Hannity in debates. So they chose this moderate named Alan Combs who since passed away. So that's how it all started. I was the, the, uh, you know, the, the face of fair, fair.org is what it is now. And it was my job to take a progressive critique of the mainstream media into the mainstream media. And I did it better than we ever dreamed. They were paying me. So I'm on Fox news getting paid by Rupert Murdoch to attack Rupert Murdoch by name on the air. And so, you know, I had more freedom, frankly, at Fox News because I was just once a week and I was on their media criticism show and I was outnumbered by two right wingers, but I had more freedom on Fox News than I ever did on CNN or later at MSNBC. To me, this is kind of like, uh, I mean, for some people, this sounds like so like this isn't allowed to happen. How did this happen? It does happen every so often, doesn't last. And we're going to learn what happened here. Uh, and it, it kind of mirrors um, what's, what's happened with uh, Kyle Kalinske. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with Kyle Kalinske of, Kalinske of Secular Talk, but, yeah. you know, massively uh, popular online progressive show. And he has gotten to appear on MSNBC multiple yeah. times. Well, um, again, yeah, I was the fluke that proved the rule. I was the exception that proved the rule. Um, the greatest example of, uh, a, a, of a guy who was sort of a fluke and he only lasted six months, I lasted more than six years, uh, is uh, Shank Uger from The Young Turks. Mm, that's you right. Know that yeah. Story? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, they, they hire, it's, it's, we tell the story well in the documentary, All Governments Lie, that I co produced. And, um, you know, he was on there for six months. He's getting good ratings, but he wasn't just being tough on Republicans, which is allowed on MSNBC. He was tough on Obama and the Democrats. And so they gave him this talking to, they said, hey, people in Washington don't like your tone. And they were basically telling Jake Uger, um, you know, you've got to tone it down, be more senatorial. And Jake's reaction is senatorial. They have a they have a lower popularity rating than television news. Yeah, seriously. You know? So at any rate, uh, they got rid of him after six months. They took away his show and he quit. He built up this huge audience like Kyle Kalinske. He built up this huge audience at the Young Turks, but he only lasted six months on MSNBC. Um, this is during the Obama years because he was journalistic. Yeah. He was critical of both parties when even the Democrats deserved criticism, and that wasn't allowed. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how many examples of this there are. Um, 
<laughs> especially at MSNBC. You uh, mentioned one th that uh, CNN can I ultimately. Want one more at sure, MSNBC. Sure, sure, sure. Let's hear it. This one is not well known. Okay. Um, and you know we'll come at it. Uh, we'll get back to it. But after we were terminated at Phil Donahue, the one progressive show terminated three weeks before the invasion of Iraq. All well, let, hold on. Let me let me. So people, just so people don't know. So you yeah. were the senior producer for the Phil Donahue show, right? Yeah, and an so. occasional guest. Mm -hmm. um, and we were taken off the air, but I'll, I'll tell that more fully. But after we're taken off the air for political reasons, the newspapers are announcing that Jesse Ventura, the independent third party, you know, governor of Minnesota and pro wrestling champ, um, was going to be taking over in our primetime slot. And so, you know, we watched and we waited and he never took over. Mm. And so my, that was in 2003, three weeks before the invasion. And my book comes out, Cable News Confidential in, 26, in 2006, and I get an email from Jesse. And, Jess, and in my book, I talked about how it wasn't just Donahue that there were lowly columnists at little newspapers that got terminated all because they acted journalistically in the run up to the invasion of Iraq when everyone else was just peddling these Bush Cheney lies. Um, so I get this email from Jesse and he says, you know, they paid me millions of dollars. And when they realized I was as anti-invasion of Iraq as you and Phil Donahue. They wouldn't let me go on the air, but they paid me so I wouldn't go anywhere else. Amazing. Uh, so that's that's another classic Incredible. example yeah. of MSNBC, you know, which is supposed to be the left-wing yeah. channel. No, they're the corporate Democratic channel. They're pro-war. They're pro-surveillance. They're anti-whistleblower. They're <laughs> anti-union, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They live that is, yeah, that is probably one of the more extreme examples since they literally paid him yeah. millions to not right. speak out against the war. That's incredible. Right. Yeah. So you have the example of the Donahue show and then the Jesse Ventura show and then Keith Oberman. Huh. Actually, I'm not, not sure about I didn't, I'm yeah. not that familiar with that. Right. Keith, well, Keith, Keith Oberman Oberman is the reason they, be, they began to move left because he was so furious at all the lies in the Bush administration, Bush. every so often he would do what was called a special comment. And this is when the internet is growing and everyone would watch his comment on the internet the next day after you know his nightly show and his ratings just boomed. And I predicted that he wouldn't last too long. Now, Oberman is a difficult uh, you know, talent, a difficult media personality. And at a certain point, he had a falling out. He, he used to argue with the bosses. They said, you're too tough. You got to tone it down. Uh, but because his ratings were so huge, uh, they let him on for a few years. But then he had a falling out and he left. He was the top rated show. When Phil Donahue was terminated, we were the top rated mm. show. Yeah. Uh, Jesse Ventura probably would have been a top rated show. Probably, Jim yeah. Ruger <laughs> in 2009 or 10 or 11 was doing great in the ratings. But as I say, he he wasn't following the party line. He was criticizing corporatism in general, not just the right wing version of it. And that's why they canceled him. And uh, Ed Schultz and Crystal yeah. Ball had similar yeah. stories. Yeah. Um, as a uh, media professor at Ithaca for 10 years, um, I mean, I'm guessing, did you cover uh, Chomsky's five media filters, right? I would assume. I was thinking it might be fun to kind of just go through the filters and you give us an example yeah. from your experience yeah. that illustrates this filter. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously we could start out with ownership and I think this gives you a good opportunity to tell, you know, your experience yeah. more in depth. Uh <laughs> right. And ownership is really crucial. You, uh, you know, Bernie Blackout does a great job. Thanks. on ownership. You've got to remind people that media are, they're not public services. They're owned by big corporations and there's strict corporate hierarchy. When I was at MSNBC, I knew I was a senior producer. I knew who my boss was. That's the executive producer of the Donahue show. I knew who she answered to. That was uh, the vice president of the channel. 
I knew he answered to the president of the channel. He answered to NBC News and the head of GE, the, the corporate executive that GE had appointed to run NBC after General Electric bought NBC. Who did they appoint? A guy who had been spent years in plastics. He, hmm. he was the head of GE Plastics. Oh, God. Okay. So, all right. So, again, when you're working there, you know what you're the a product. Is. You are a product. You are yeah. nothing more than like some plastic no. product. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. And you're, but you know who you answer to on these big issues of who gets on the air and who doesn't, mm -hmm. what topics get covered and what don't. And so, near the end of Donahue, and by the way, we only went over there. For people who are young, Phil Donahue was once Oprah Winfrey. He opened the door for Oprah Winfrey. He was the pioneer who started talk TV during the afternoon with huge audiences where you could talk about real issues. And Phil was a progressive, pro-gay rights when that was unacceptable, had leading atheist on the air when that was unacceptable had civil rights, his, his leading guests in order in the daytime Phil Donahue show, watched by millions. His main, his number one guest was Ralph Nader, the consumer mm. champion. Second leading guest was Jesse Jackson, the civil rights champion. And his third most uh, frequent guest was Gloria Steinem, uh, the feminist champion, when feminism wasn't discussed on TV. So at any rate, I convinced Phil Donahue to go to get back into cable news after 9-11 because the media had gone dipshits mm -hmm. with regard to pushing for war, permanent war. And so I convinced Phil to go and MSNBC hires him. He won't come over unless they hire me. Nice. Um, and they promise us total independence. You know, yeah. <laughs> now, I was not naive, you know, <laughs> I, and yet I said, so we're going to be able to be as left wing. Uh, and we were going up against the number one figure in the history of cable news, um, Bill O'Reilly. And so I said to them before I, I agreed to sign a contract, I said, so let me get this straight. We're going to be, a, we can be as left wing as Bill O'Reilly as right wing. We can be as, daring and bold and, and naming names like O'Reilly does. Of course, O'Reilly lies all the time. Yeah. We would do it by telling the truth. And they gave us such assurances. And I'm the idiot who, even though I was a media critic, I said, who, yeah. you know, I who wouldn't want to believe it? Who wouldn't want to believe it? You <laughs> right. know? Right. That. And, yeah. and, you know, with Phil Donahue as my protector and he was, a, he's a legend. He won like 18 Emmys. You know, I said, gee, I'm here with Phil Donahue. They can't shut down Phil Donahue, can they? Mm. Uh, they're not going to pay Phil Donahue huge amounts of money. And he's known as the leading liberal on TV. And they're going to shut him up, are they? And I was totally wrong. Because before we even went on the air, which was July of 2002, mm. they started giving us all these demands. Mm. And they we brought on a guy who was skeptical that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. But they said, we can't have him on the air, a weapons inspector, a real expert, unless we had someone out shouting him. Mm -hmm. So our very first week, they had already started to take control of the show. Mm -hmm. And they're telling us who can get on the air and who can't. We wanted to book the at former attorney general of the country, Ramsey Clark, who was a very articulate critic of U.S. foreign policy and was saying this invasion of Iraq will be stupid. And the next day we were told Ramsey Clark is not supposed to be on the air on MSNBC. So, they, you know, this wasn't 1953, it was yeah. 2003. You know? Yeah, yeah. What that was made, their, what was their, I mean, reasoning there? Did they give you a reason or? Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, not allowed on the air. That's he it. Does, that's just, that's all there is to it. With us. He wasn't, he's not allowed on our channel. Wow. Wow. It was like a blacklist 50 years after we thought the blacklist had ended. What mm. people have to realize about television, and I pointed out in the book, is television grew up in the Joe McCarthy era, the era of the blacklist. It's never really stopped. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, they can have Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes, but you can't be someone who you can't get on the air regularly if you're against the system. You're blacklisted. Yeah, I mean, that's so troubling. I I, I knew they wouldn't allow, you know, I heard they wouldn't allow you have on these anti-war voices without, you know, other voices balancing them. Um, but man, I, I mean, just that full on blacklist of uh, right. people who are, you know, experts, including the, you said a weapons inspector. Now they, would they not let him on or at all, or did they no, eventually he, let him on with, he was allowed on early. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we had him out shouted by someone yeah. who didn't know what the evidence See, was. Yeah. This is and, a, th yeah. this is somebody, if you, you're covering whether or not Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, yeah. who is a better, more appropriate person to have than someone who is an actual weapons inspector and, and the is, only guy who got it right oh, he, yeah. he'd been a united nations i'm talking about scott ritter okay so near the end as we got closer to the war every time we would mention bringing scott ritter back they would say oh we we've heard these stories that he's getting funded by saddam hussein so and so he would started getting wow. smeared like in the 50s during the blacklist yeah and so he got off. He wasn't on the air anymore. And then as we got closer to the war, this you've heard me talk about. They developed what I called a affirmative action for right wingers. Hmm. Uh, they, they demanded on the Phil Donahue show, which, again, when we started, they said, oh, you'll have complete freedom over who you can book and what what subjects. It was a complete lie. And near the end. They said, if you book a guest who's anti-war, you have to book two guests on the left. If you book, I'm sorry, two guests right. who are pro-war. Yeah, yeah. If you book two guests on the left, you have to have three on the right. And at a uh, at a meeting, no, no, no. One, if you book an anti-war guest, they told us you have to have two pro-war. If you book uh, uh, two guests on the left, you need three on the right. And uh, uh, I was at a meeting of all the producers where a producer says somewhat excitedly, I could book Michael Moore and was told you'll have to have three right wingers to balance Sorry. Michael Moore yeah. ideologically. And so, you know, I used to privately think about booking Noam Chomsky as a guest, uh, but our, uh, our stage couldn't accommodate the 28 right wingers we would have needed for <laughs> ideological balance. <laughs> But yeah, so when you think about what happened to us at MSNBC and you realize General Electric makes a lot of money from war, that the guy who was running all of the NBC networks was a former plastics executive, um, uh, that, you know, we ran into ownership problems. Yeah, I did it. I did it. CNN. And obviously, when I was at Fox, the owner is Murdoch. And at Fox, I had a little more freedom than at CNN or MSNBC, but they did bring me in a couple of times and they talked to me and they threatened to fire me. And it was because of Murdoch. So ownership is, of course, the number one filter that reinforces corporate media bias. There's an incredible uh, little clip. I don't know if you've seen it of Murdoch, old black and white film uh, talking about his, uh, you know, media empire, even back then, obviously expanded. Where, much since since the 70s i think this was the 70s right. and he says i give my uh editors tons of freedom the only ones who you know who, who complain about it are the uh, or who, who i don't is are the ones that don't know how to use it in the first place <laughs> <laughs> so the ones who aren't using their freedom as he wants to well they don't get any freedom you have yeah. freedom to do what as you know to do what you wish as long as it's exactly what Rupert Murdoch wants. Right. Well, that's the one beauty of Murdoch is he was perpetually telling the truth, mm -hmm. which is something you won't hear from Comcast and some of the other owners that mm -hmm. Murdoch would say, look, the buck stops here. Of course, I'm going to intervene. And then during the uh, run up after the invasion of Iraq, he was on camera saying, well, of course, all of my ch I was pro war. And every media outlet I owned across the globe was pro-invasion of Iraq. It's possible that there was no single most important person in bringing about the war in Iraq, 
than Rupert Murdoch, especially his media in the US and the UK. But it needs to be remembered that MSNBC, then owned by General Electric, CNN, then owned by Time Warner, um, these networks were lockstep with Murdoch and Bush and Cheney in promoting the war. And that's why we got terminated three weeks before the invasion. It was purely political. And the day after we were terminated, thank God for a whistleblower, uh, a doc documents leaked out showing that they were worried about having a voice like Phil Donahue on the air when our compet quote, when our competitors will be waving the flag at every opportunity. What did MSNBC and CNN do? They waved the flag at every opportunity, just like Fox News, and they brought us the war in Iraq, which has got disastrous consequences till today. Yeah. Uh, and and then, and just to add insult to injury, who did they? Uh, who did they? They didn't bring on Jesse. Wasn't there the uh, Savage, right? Didn't yeah. they bring on Guy yeah. Savage? <laughs> they had Michael Savage on for a few months. Now, he was so right wing <laughs> that Fox News wouldn't go near him. <laughs> what people don't understand, when I hear about MSNBC as the left wing alternative to Fox, I say, no, it's the corporate liberal, corporate centrist alternative to Fox. And it will never be left wing because thank you, Matt, for bringing up the first filter, because of ownership. It was owned by General Electric then, it's owned by Comcast now. And during that period in 2003, they were putting people on the air that were too far right wing for even Fox News. For a brief moment, they were trying to out, out uh, right wing, outflank Fox on the right. That's not an easy thing to do, but they tried to do it for months. And so they'll go anywhere. Mm -hmm. If there's another 9-11 or, you know, or, you know, they'll, they'll start bowing down to whoever uh, if it protects their profits. Sure. The biggest freedom of the press issue today is not that Trump is nasty to mainstream reporters. It's that Trump and his Federal Communications Commission uh, have moved to end net neutrality, to end mm -hmm. an open internet. So they're, they're working, and it got gummed up in the courts, but Trump and the FCC have ended net neutrality if it hadn't been gummed up in the courts, which means that the few giant internet service providers, if they don't like your podcast, or they don't like Democracy Now!, or the Young Turks, they can move all of them in the slow lane. Any website that they do not like, that they do not own, that does not pay them can be moved into a slow lane. And a funny thing, two of the biggest internet service providers are supposedly, are, are the owners of what are supposedly anti-Trump, you know, left-wing mm -hmm. channels. AT&T owns CNN, Comcast owns MSNBC. They're both working hand in glove with Trump to get mm -hmm. rid of net neutrality yeah. while they own the allegedly anti-Trump yeah. channels. Yeah, you the net neutrality, yeah, the net yeah. neutrality that, you know, th that prevents them from, you know, profiting off of you know, of of, of offering a higher service to larger corporations. No so, doubt. Yeah, so again, but yeah, you, th never, this is you never hear about net neutrality on CNN and MSNBC, you'll hear that Trump is nasty to this or that yeah. reporter, and it is outrageous. Mm -hmm. But the worst issue of press freedom that's threatening us is that these giant corporations that own these corporate centrist channels, CNN and MSNBC, that they will that now in a year or two or three, if they win in the courts, mm -hmm. they will be able to push all of us into a slow lane and and monopolize the internet like they monopolize television. Yeah. It's you know, it's it's not a conspiracy theory. It's very yeah. simple and basic. Yeah. Um <laughs> the internet service providers that own the the mainstream media in these instances they don't even cover the issues 
uh, no. that could threaten their power. This and and always, like what this has yeah. always been the case, and we're still on this topic of we only- are. We, I know, but, but, but there's one other. I mean, this okay. is probably the best current example. Yes. But then there's also the, the another excellent massive example, and that's the the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because. I mean, FAIR was in the bit, middle of that, working with consumer groups. It was allowing a few these few media giants to get even bigger. And um, it helped Time Warner. It helped Rupert Murdoch and Fox. And they would not discuss the issue. This was the biggest change of media and communications law in 60 years since the 1930s set up the Federal Radio Commission that became the Federal Communications Commission. So uh, uh, it's a bipartisan thing where a Democratic president, the, the administration of Clinton and Gore, are working hand in hand with the Republican Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. They're, both parties are getting huge funding from media and communications corporations. And behind closed doors, they develop this uh, Communications Act of 1996 that gives these fat media companies, uh, allows them to get even fatter. Yep. And so on CNN, they wouldn't discuss it. This was before there was any, uh, you know, CNN was the only cable channel. And a consumer group raised the money to pay for 60 second ads, warning consumers how bad it would be if this act that no one had ever heard of, because the mainstream media, especially television, didn't cover it. Um, if this act gets passed and uh, CNN would not accept the money and run the ad. Amazing. A company that, you know, of course, takes money for political yeah. ads. <laughs> it's one of their big revenue streams, but they wouldn't run an ad on a story that they had suppressed, which was the telecommunications bill that allowed big media companies to get even bigger. So telling. Yeah. Wow. So shall, shall we try to, shall we move on to filter number two? What Ad, is it? Advertising. Advertising. Yeah. Well, I gave one example already that I personally experienced, which is um, when when I did not get hired to be the co-host of a show. And by the way, if I'd been the host for two months, mm -hmm. it would have changed my life. I would have been a millionaire. My lecture fees would, have, you know, but I was unwilling to do what they wanted which is to apologize for the Clintons and apologize for corporate policies. Um, and the one big st sticking uh, uh, point was they were worried I was gonna attack the sponsors and especially the sponsor of their big show Crossfire, which was General Electric. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard uh, year after year from people that work in mainstream television that told me they couldn't cover certain stories because of the advertisers. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows it's true. Anyone who's in the mainstream media who lies about it is lying only because they haven't left their job yet. Because after they leave their job, they'll usually tell the truth about stories that got suppressed on behalf of advertisers. One of uh, the, uh, the good examples... Um is i believe you correct me if i'm wrong, but um it was a nike story so nike uh was advertising for the olympics covered on nbc i think yeah. and they um nbc was going to run a story on uh the bit poor conditions at the nike factories yes but but nike wouldn't let them uh put that story out well here's the yeah this star reporter, I've written about this repeatedly. Uh, she had produced, and she won awards. She'd produced a piece on Nike sweatshops across the globe. And she it was got huge ratings, huge mail. You know, this is before internet. Uh, and they said, well, yeah, we want you to do a follow-up. And then the Olympics start approaching. I think they were in Japan that year. And NBC... No, it was CBS. Okay. Because this was 60 okay. Minutes. Am okay. I right? She was a 60 I, I, I wish I yeah, could yeah, remember. Yeah. Okay. But the network that was running the Olympics had a deal with Nike where every reporter, not just sports journalists, but even the news reporters that were over there, had to have the Nike swoosh on their parka. 
<laughs> and so, uh, you know, management says, wait a second, you can't allow her to do a follow-up. <laughs> We've got this sponsorship deal with Nike. Nike they, sucks. Oh, Sponsored yeah. by Nike. <laughs> yeah. And they killed it. They So she never did a follow-up. Yeah. And, um, but again, there's story after story. I mean, think, bring up to the present day where you had, and I wish Ber Bernie Blackout, which is a great movie, but I wish it had focused a little more on the debate bias mm. because millions of viewers who weren't following the election, they would watch the debate, whether it was 10 candidates, 20. And these debates, you have the, the, in, the questioners are asking questions, tough ones of Bernie and, you know, single payer, you want Medicare for all. And then they cut away and it would be a commercial mm -hmm. from the insurance companies yep. running 30 second propagandistic lies about Medicare for all. Yeah. Bernie even called it out on the debates, predicted it. And, and it happened. I mean, yeah. And it happened. Yeah. And then there's the, of course, Bernie is the reason that Walmart workers had got a slight raise. He's been fighting Walmart for years. A Walmart employee or stockholder allowed Bernie to be a uh, surrogate, a proxy. And he went to their last, uh, the Walmart shareholders meeting, and he's advocating for higher wages and, you know, all this pressure that Bernie had brought to bear on a, um, on this giant corporation. And then during one of the first debates, the first commercial is Walmart. Now, so if you're wondering why these reporters kept coming after Bernie, who was telling the truth about Walmart, telling the truth about insurance companies, he got all these tough questions and Joe Biden was BSing about Medicare for all, saying it would be too costly. Mm -hmm. Every economist knows that if we stick with private insurance, it's going to be far more expensive than Medicare for all. Everyone knows it. Mm -hmm. Every, even the go federal government has put out studies for 25 years saying that. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, but, the insurance companies, their stocks went up after the Affordable Care Act passed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know where they really zoomed? When? When? Bernie announced he was withdrawing. He was suspended. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it went through the room. So, again, if you're Jake Tapper at CNN, if you're Dana Bash at CNN, you know who the sponsors are. You're sponsored by the fossil fuel industry. You're sponsored by Big Pharma. Big Pharma is the biggest sponsor of the nightly network TV news. Uh, so it's it's... It's really crucial. Everyone knows it. That's who pays them. The, you know, the income for television is provided free generally. And so the revenue is coming from these sponsors and every higher up in the TV news business knows it. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember reading uh, Washington Post articles online. They were emb embedded with big pharma commercials. Yeah. Um, next filter is sourcing. Yeah, that's the key. Uh, you guys did a good job in Bernie Blackout. It's what we call access journalism. Mm -hmm. when, when I use the phrase, when you hear the phrase TV news show, the operative word is show. It's a show. And a TV show needs stars. And if you're a mainstream guy who owns a TV network or a mainstream guy who's a TV news president, you want the biggest stars you can get. You want the secretaries of state. You want the secretaries of defense. You want the former CIA chiefs. Uh, you want uh, business executives. But if you're criticizing the CIA, if you're criticizing the Pentagon, if you're calling these people perjurers, and most of the people that parade on MSNBC and CNN have gone before Senate and House committees and lied, and by the way, those are often the most frequent experts on CNN and MSNBC, but if you want those big names, you can't criticize these institutions that they hail from. So if your TV news show, operative word show, and you want access to the stars, you have to kiss their ass. Mm -hmm. Jake Uger wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. 
Clinton. So in 2010, 2011, whenever he got terminated at MSNBC, it's because peop- uh, the bosses said, you're making it hard for us to book guests. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the key when you and you could move this from TV news to print. And, uh-huh. Because uh, in New York Times, Washington Post, FAIR has done study after study on an uh, important issue like whether they should uh, ratify the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1993, which helped big corporations, but hurt unions, hurt workers, hurt consumers, hurt the environment. You did uh, FAIR did a study of who who was on the front page of the New York Times and Washington Post. And it was like three to one pro-NAFTA versus anti-NAFTA. Mm-hmm. Virtually no union people, but corporate executives were quoted in one article after another. Mm-hmm. And you can just document the bias when you look at who are the sources and who aren't the sources. FAIR has studied TV news for decades. And it's always white male corporate sources, pro-war sources, And these movements that represent millions of people, whether it's the climate movement, the environment movement, the union movement, um, the civil rights movement, those people are rarely heard from. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll have African-Americans, they'll have women, but they usually aren't from the progressive wing of the feminist movement or the civil rights movement. So the movements don't speak for themselves. And FAIR has documented the pro-corporate anti-public interest bias of the sourcing of mainstream news. And we should say, as we're going through these five filters of manufacturing consent, it's Ed Herman, the late Ed Herman, who developed. And Herman and Chomsky wrote this brilliant book, Manufacturing Consent. Yeah, Herman doesn't really doesn't get the credit he deserves. He's the main author, and even yeah. and I went ahead just like everyone else. I said the five Chomsky's well, the five filters. <laughs> yeah, I was quoted in the obituaries in the New York Times and Washington Post about Ed Herman, who died <laughs> recently. And I pointed out I once brought up to Ed Herman, who was a, just a god. He was such a wonderful person, a mentor to every media critic younger than Ed. And, um, you know, in the movie Goodwill Hunting, hmm. um, there's a scene between Will, played by Matt Damon, and the psychologist played by um, Robin Williams, Robin Williams, where one of them brings up the book, uh, uh, Howard Zinn's um, People's Skin- History of the United okay. States. And, the, uh, and then Robin Williams, to impress him, says, Yes, have you read Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent? And I remember asking Ed uh, right after the movie came out, Ed, uh, what do you think when you see uh, like a blockbuster <laughs> movie? And you know, you're the prime, you know, Ed wrote like 55, 60% of it. Noam admittedly wrote 40, 45% of it. Um, and I said to Ed, what do you, you know, do you mind when you know it's always called Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent? He said, I don't mind. It sells books when we're mentioned. Uh, in a movie. Yeah, yeah. And I want people to read the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. More about the me- message. Be- cares yeah. more about the message than the ego. So, yeah. yeah. Good for Edward, him. yeah. And, and so yeah. is Noam Chomsky. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you get, to, and so is Howard Zinn, and so is Gloria Steinem. I mean, when you meet the real movement leaders, not the ones that necessarily get on TV all the time. Mm. But the ones who are totally principled, um, yeah. they have I, no I, Yeah, I sense that. I get that from uh, S- Smalls, uh, the Amazon, uh, the guy who organized the recent Amazon strike, who yeah. Amazon's trying to go out and smear him. He, yeah. I was listening to his, an interview with him on the Jimmy Dore show, and it only like at the very end, he, he, um, you know, he, he's like, no, no, I organized the whole thing, the whole thing, <laughs> and like he yeah. was like he. He he had he had he had been talking to the press for like this long and he didn't like he had never like you know made clear that you know how much of it he was behind anyway right. it just came no, out randomly no, no. casually it's, yeah right. I mean in a democracy the heroes within journalism because you need journalism for it to be a democracy the heroes would be these unsung community sure. organizers and good journalists would seek them out. 
That's what yeah. I love about your documentary, uh, Bernie Blackout, is you just see all these young, selfless people that gave up a half a year or a year of their lives for the Bernie movement. And hopefully they're not going to be totally into despair. They're going to go back to the climate movement or the, uh, you know, the black freedom movement. You know, uh, what I love is that the movie shows all these young people that are young activists and mainstream journalism would really shine a light on a lot of these talented organizers who no one's ever heard of. But that's not we have corporate journalism. We don't mm -hmm. have small D democratic journalism. And that brings up another point is is uh, just the, the reason people do this, this sourcing uh, or, or they, you know, it's not just uh, access to. Uh, celebrity status politicians, which is a huge part of it, huge part of it. But another part of it is it's just easier to be like, oh, these sources, these these sources from the government say this. They want me to say that they gave the memo says this and you just push it out. It's just easy. They write your articles Rolodex. for you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the Rolodex syndrome. You know, mm -hmm. in the old days, we had these things on cards that were called Rolodexes. Now you have calendars in your computer, your contact list. But yeah, it's the Rolodex syndrome. It's round up all the usual suspects. Hmm. These people work for giant think tanks. They have PR people. And, and that's an important thing for every one journalist. We have like six or seven. Oh, PR scary people. stuff. Right. Yeah. So all of these, the, the, the people you see in regular rotation, even if they're usually wrong, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You know, we had a slogan at FAIR, the more off you are, the more on you are. The more off you are factually, the more on you are on the air. Mm -hmm. And so these same pundits who are saying, you know, Biden can beat Trump, but Bernie will be a disaster that will lead to a Trump landslide. They were the ones who told us in 2000, Gore could beat, you know, the establishment corporate candidate can always, for the Democrats, is always the most electable. They said that about Gore in 2000, mm -hmm. he lost. They said that about Democratic candidate John Kerry in 2004, he lost. They said that about Hillary Clinton in 2016, she lost. And these pundits who are wrong, 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 mm -hmm. wrong, who have all yeah. these public relations professionals, they just get on the air. <laughs> you know, yeah. they were all wrong about the war in Iraq. And now they're yeah. the ones polarizing around Iran. And Yeah, the, and the one... What's the name of uh, one of these guys I heard you mention? Um, Barry McCaffrey. Is he the one? I'm I'm trying to think of the guy who says, well, he he kept saying that oh, weapons, rockets, weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. And then after, and he's presented as an expert, and he right. keeps presenting. And then afterwards, right, uh, he goes, yeah. uh, I'm I'm just saying what the experts. <laughs> yeah, that was, was just... one of these think tank guys. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was presented as the expert. I think his name is Pollock. I don't remember. Okay. On CNN, New York Times, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards said, no, I was just parroting what the weapons experts were telling me. And again, it's it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. I know. I know. Well, um, if I'm not laughing, I'm crying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, right, it's right. Like... You almost have to laugh to keep from crying yeah, when you talk yeah. about corporate media. But uh -huh. I mean, think about it. These guys who got it totally wrong on the worst, on the biggest foreign policy debate in our country's recent history, whether to invade or not invade Iraq. Brian Williams got it wrong. Uh, uh, Lester Holt, who's now the NBC, he got it totally wrong. He was with me on MSNBC. Mm. The people who got it wrong, whether they were hosts or experts, their careers have just gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. And no one had to say you're sorry. Being an expert or a host on TV news or mainstream media means never having to say you're sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really sickening. Now, if you criticize Israel mildly once, you might get pulled off the air. Like uh, Mark Lamont Hill. Yeah, Mark, Mark Lamont Hill is a great recent example. And there have mm -hmm. been many. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Helen Thomas. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But there, there's great examples of people who get it right, but criticize someone in power and their career is lost. But the people who get it wrong over and over, even when it has the consequences of millions of lives yeah. lost, yeah. 
they stay on the air. Yeah. And, and if you're one of the politicians responsible, for, you, you get yeah. to be nominated for president. I Hillary mean, it's just insane. Biden. Yeah, well, it's just nuts. Think, think about it. There were some brave members of Congress. I, I mean, I was involved in this fight uh, in the run up to the invasion of Iraq. You didn't have to be a genius to know that Bush Cheney were lying. And most Democrats in the House voted against the authorization. Um, and half of the Democrats in the Senate voted against authorizing the invasion of Iraq. But the ones who voted for it are the ones who get elevated by the mm -hmm. corporate Democratic establishment and the media establishment. Mm -hmm. So who voted against it? John Kerry. He was the nominee of the Democratic Party in 2004. Who else voted against it? Hillary uh, voted for Hillary the uh, yeah the Iraq War resolution. Right. Yeah. By uh, Kerry voted to invade Iraq. He becomes the 2004 nominee. Hillary Clinton uh, supported the invasion of Iraq. She's the 2016 nominee. Joe Biden supported the invasion of Iraq. Huge and leadership was, role. Yeah, very. Yeah, who was the most important Democratic senator in uh, in enabling the invasion, and he's a, the apparent nominee in 2020. Just, that's, yeah. yeah. And uh, I wonder if this, it seems like the access filter actually is responsible for this uh the the people who got it wrong they they're going up and i think it's because they have the access with power so you know hey you got the access we want the access you're sticking with us we want to keep you with us we'll even promote you and it there's just perpetuates great, the whole thing yeah on access there's a great book called this town by mm -hmm. mark Leibovich. it's a new he's a new york times political reporter for usually a new york times magazine it's not an exposé it's not a muckraking book, but it's the most muckraking, eye-opening book you'll ever read because Mark Leibovich is in that group. Hmm. And he writes about all these people who, you know, you're working for at the highest levels of the government and your spouse is at CNN or MSNBC or New York Times. You, you learn who the spouses are by reading that book. It's a gossipy insider book. Hmm. And you realize how it's a club. So when people were watching the uh, discussions, there's a big rift in the Democratic Party between the base of the party, uh, most of the activists in the party, most of the voters of the party is in the progressive wing. And then there's the corporate wing of the party, which is allied with the media and the donor class. And when you have these debates, they, they'd actually announce which way the Democratic Party, should it go progressive or, you know, or be moderate? Uh, which is their word, their euphemism for corporate. Mm -hmm. um, and in those discussions of the future of the Democratic Party, they'll have like five or six people. And a lot of them, they'll have not one pro-Bernie person mm -hmm. because that's not in their Rolodex. That's not, So they have one Bernie basher after another, sometimes different degrees of progressive bashers. Mm -hmm. to, and it was all this issue of Bernie will be a, down ballot disaster. We might even lose the House of Representatives of Bernie. And it was a drumbeat. Bernie can't beat Trump. Bernie can't beat Trump. Mm -hmm. And it's that electability issue that's why so many voters in Democratic primaries who told pollsters right after they voted, I support the Bernie agenda, they voted for Biden. And so I mean, they heard this drumbeat from this little yeah. coterie of sources, these alleged experts telling mm -hmm. you Biden, who, you know, he seems weak to the human eye and mm -hmm. incoherent. He's strong. Bernie's weak. And enough voters bought it. Yeah. But even though they like the progressive agenda, they got it drummed into their head that Bernie can't beat Trump. And, you know, it, it's I could explain it with one word. I could just. Mississippi. I mean, Mississippi. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. 81% to 15%. It was more than a landslide for Biden against Bernie in the Democratic primary. And then they asked people as they, right after they voted, NBC News exit polls, what's your, uh, where do you stand on, uh, what's your opinion of Medicare for all? 
which they defined accurately as uh, the government providing a single insurance plan to all. And by two to one, people had just voted for Biden. Amazing. Yeah. By two to one, they embraced the signature Bernie Sanders issue mm-hmm. that Joe Biden in debate after debate had lied about. Yeah. So, and even uh, went so far as to say that he would probably or suggest that he would veto it if it passed. Veto. That's the amazing thing is because his in the debates, his whole thing was like, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. I can't, it's just not realistic. It's not, that's why I'm against it because it's not realistic. Yeah. Okay. Well, what if it were realistic and it came to your test? Uh, I'd probably yeah. veto it. <laughs> yeah. It's, again, this stuff would be all laughable. But uh, while the mainstream media propaganda against Medicare for all, is it's intense, but it did yeah. not fully succeed. Mm. The mainstream media propaganda that Bernie couldn't be Trump did succeed, mm-hmm. and it explains why Bernie is not the nominee. And and it's an age thing. We haven't talked about this. Um, mm-hmm. the mainstream media younger voters voted for Bernie. Oh. Mm-hmm. They liked mm-hmm. his program. Yeah. They get their news from more independent social media, independent media, progressive media. And they voted for Bernie. Mm -hmm. Um, Older people, even if they like the Bernie agenda, where do they get their news? The median age of CNN viewer, 65. The median age of an MSNBC viewer, 65. The median age of a New York Times reader, 65. The median age of an NPR listener, it's somewhere between 55 and 60. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, even if you're progressive thinking, but you hear hour after hour from the alleged experts that you and I have been trashing, mm-hmm. but who are presented as the real thing, the real deal. Mm-hmm. If they're telling you that the safe vote is Biden and the risky vote is Bernie, and you hear it from the New York Times, you read it, then you hear it on NPR, then you see it on CNN. Gee, I like Bernie, but I'm voting Biden. And it might explain these these poll results, which are striking. And I don't know any other way of explaining them. Mm -hmm. So we covered uh, number one, ownership, number two, advertising, number three, sourcing, access journalism. Uh, Now let's move on to flack. And we did cover a little flack. We talked about, you know, what happens if you speak out against uh, Israel. If you have any criticism of Israel, you'll lose your job like Helen Thomas, Mark Lamont Hill. Um, uh, What else? Did you? Yeah. yeah, Well, you certainly faced flack yourself. Oh, I had it my whole career. Mm -hmm. My what else kid. besides, obviously, you know, you lost, you and Phil lost the show. What yeah. else? Well, there some other- you get, you get flack when, when uh, Herman and Chomsky are talking about flack, they're talking about these professional, oh, yeah, yeah. well-paid groups whose whole job is to look at anyone who's doing something unusual or unusually progressive or anti-war in the mainstream media and then hound those people till they get fired. Hmm. and. Um, obviously one of the most powerful groups is the Israel right or wrong lobby. They have been responsible for many mainstream media heads. I I remember sitting actually at Phil Donahue's, uh, I don't want to drop names, but at Phil Donahue's, I'm sitting with uh, Mike Wallace from Mm -hmm. CBS 60 Minutes, a legend. Mm -hmm. And as the head of FAIR for uh, those first years, I, uh, I, we would often, you know, we're a media criticism group. We would often praise Mike Wallace because he was, and he's Jewish, one of the few journalists who would do journalism critical of Israel. Mm-hmm. And I said, boy, you must have taken some flack for that. And he said, you cannot imagine. And I mean, mm-hmm. Mike Wallace is, was a legend. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so Israel is always an issue. Uh, too critical of a particular corporation will get you into trouble because the corporations hire these flak operations with the phony names, partners oh, it's for so bad. Yeah. coalition for that. It's and then so there's Fox News. Uh, Fox News will run, uh, well, they'll take someone who does something right in the media and persecute them and persecute them and persecute them. And then they'll say, uh, the mainstream media is protecting this left-wing journalist, you know. So Fox News is powerful, um, and 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 then there are these right-wing groups, Media yeah. Research Center, uh, which has a certain amount of power. Uh, so 
that's always been a problem of yeah. uh, where they will single someone out, start a drumbeat, and then the uh, spineless corporate ownership, which cares only about profits and not protecting aggressive journalists. They say, look, it's too big a, 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 a you're, you're too big a deal. The, the, it happens sometimes in politics too, where yeah. uh, you know the spineless corporate democratic leaders will get rid of someone in their administration. I mean, Fox News went after Van Jones, who was the green jobs czar mm -hmm. in the Obama mm -hmm. administration. Yeah. Uh, and they just went after him. They went after him. They went after him. Uh, they brought out stuff when he used to be a leftist and uh, Obama got rid of him. Yep. Yeah. It happened years earlier when Bill Clinton was going to appoint someone who used to be a close friend, uh, I'm blanking on her name, but uh, Alani Guineer, she was one of the great advocates for civil rights. Her mom, uh, uh, Jewish, her, her dad, African-American, a great hero of the civil rights struggle. She's a professor at Harvard. They were going to hire her into a civil rights job at the Justice Department. And the right wing did it. Uh, they did this, brought up all these things, smeared her, lied about her, and then the liberals caved. Yeah, so, it's, it's I bad. Mean, yeah. So uh, right wing flack, uh, they just know that the liberals will cave, whether they're Democratic leaders or media leaders, and they will mm -hmm. get rid of a someone who is too progressive, too independent. Well, you say right wing, right wing flack, but I mean, is it fair to say that this is kind of these are all, uh, you know, filters that affect any uh, really any. So I think, you know, so you could have an independent progressive uh, outlet and I'm sure, you know, ownership is going to affect how they report things, right. uh, advertising, um, you know, where they get the okay. sort, you know, they're, they're going to want access to a big uh, speaker. I mean, it's all possible on any on on you know no matter where the political spectrum of course you know it's it's a much bigger issue in corporate media because corporate media is way way more powerful at this point <laughs> at this point that's that. right um, yeah well but again all of these filters are reinforcing mm -hmm. you know, yeah the yeah ownership and the advertising yeah is the reason they choose these experts and mm -hmm. you know, yeah part of the yep. reason they cave into the flack but yeah a lot of times it's corporate flack like the few times 60 Minutes has done some good environmental reporting, like on chemicals in apples, the corporations will just start running full page ads, naming a producer mm, of mm. 60 Minutes until they get this, that person fired. It's bad. Yeah. yeah. I, and a similar thing happened. Well, I guess this was this was back in, pol in, in politics, but this this um, this current election, uh, I mean, it happened to me a little bit. Jenk uh, Uger, I think the New York Times, they dug up just old stuff from like two decades ago, even like on a blog blog that he'd already apologized for. And, right. and what the worst, the worst is they also brought up, um, they basically they misframed something terribly to make it look like he was supporting, uh, David Duke. Yeah. But it, but it was just, a, it was just misframed in such a way that it was an absolute lie. And they eventually they did, uh, redact it or retract it, retract right. it. Um, and that, that's, yeah, but the damage is already exactly, done. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Damage has already been done. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, you understand that certain people are fair game to meet mainstream media smears yeah. and yeah. other people aren't. Yeah. That's what they, they see that. Okay. This is a, this is a, a, a target that we can attack and, and that it won't affect our careers. It may help help our careers. Right. Even if I get the facts totally wrong, mm -hmm. I'm going after someone who an is an enemy. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, and speaking of enemy, so that's that's filter number five. Uh, a co I think in the book it's just referred to as communism um, yeah. or a common enemy. Now yeah. might be more accurate. Um, well, I think lately in, in the days that. Uh, in the 1980s, when manufacturing consent came out, you would often be, if you spoke out for a rational foreign policy, well, you were soft on communism. Mm -hmm. That changed in the last 20 years to if you spoke out against our militaristic foreign policy, which produces more terrorists than it can kill, 
you're soft on terrorism. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that filter, it's where you get labeled as part of the enemy. It mm -hmm. happened a lot recently with Russiagate. Yep. Where if you said, look, uh, Putin's a bad guy, but we can't lie and make, uh, you know, like he's the main enemy facing U.S. democracy because we need to have nuclear agreements with Russia. And if you said that, you'd be called a useful idiot of the yeah. Russians. Yeah. So that's that filter. It, it's sort of like flack. Uh, it's just a way of demonizing someone and drive them out of the media. They're no longer acceptable in mainstream discourse because you've tarred them as soft on terrorism, soft on Russia, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah. So when you go through all these filters, <laughs> well, the, but the, what you end up with is, is not great journalism. <laughs> it's, not, right, it's not journalism yeah. and it's not democracy. Well, yeah. you know, and uh, I mean, I heartily recommend your movie, uh, Bernie Blackout. It's really an updated, there've been so many great documentaries about mainstream media bias. I've been in a bunch of them. Uh, manufacturing Consent. Uh, it is good. Yeah, it's a good document. It's on YouTube. If people people yeah, can check it out on YouTube. Brilliant. You can find it. Outfoxed is more an attack just on Fox News Channel. Uh, I co-produced All Governments Lie, Truth, Deception, and the Spirit of I.F. Stone, which, like your movie, it's a celebration of independent journalists. It's a critique of mainstream and a celebration of independent journalists. We mm -hmm. feature in that movie, All Governments Lie, uh, which is on iTunes or everywhere else, uh, we feature Amy Goodman, Cenk Uger, Anna Kasparian, um, people at The Nation, The Intercept, all these independent, non-corporate, and indeed anti-corporate outlets. So what I like about Bernie Blackout is you point out that there is this independent journalist sector. It's very young. It's very diverse. It's people building up their own followings, not controlled by corporations. And if it wasn't for this media sector, there would have been no Bernie campaign in 2016 or 2020. Yeah. You, you know, I, I was quoted, there was actually a good article in the LA Times uh, uh, months ago by Evan Halper, where he talked about how the Bernie campaign didn't come out of nowhere. It built both in 2016 and this time on the backs of social movements and on the backs of independent journalism. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. as Bernie got bigger, so did these, these movements and independent mm -hmm. media. Like mm -hmm. commondreams.org is one of, you know, it's, it's my favorite news outlet, news source. And um, I use it as my homepage. And they're very allied with Bernie-type voters. And, you know, they're just through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, Fair.org, which you know, has been attacking anti-Bernie media bias for years now, uh, they've seen their membership grow. So so these groups and journalists have helped Bernie and the Bernie movements have helped these organizations and these journalists. It's really synergistic. And yes. I want people not to be in despair. Uh, I mean, it's crucial that Trump be defeated uh, in November, but these social movements are not going away. If Biden or whoever the Democratic nominee can beat Trump, we're going to be there on January 20th with social movements ready to polarize with whoever the Democratic president is uh, when they do their expected corporatization or uh, uh, vacillation. So, I mean, the progressive movement, because of all the young people, is strong. I can say this as someone who is in the anti-Vietnam War movement and civil rights in the 1960s, I've never been more inspired by the progressive community and movements than I am in 2020. We have to get rid of Trump, and then we have to fight the corporate Democrats and replace them within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But I feel optimistic about it. And, and your movie does such a great job of showing all these young people that have gotten a real political education in the last few months or last few years. Thanks so much, Jeff. And I just got to tell, you know, just so everybody understands, I can't say it's my movie. It's directed by Pat McGee. Yeah. I worked on As It On, 
or for it as a producer for a bit. And I'm very glad Pat gave me the opportunity to help out a little bit in that sense. But yeah, it's a great movie by Pat McGee and many others. Um, and, and, and we got Jeff in there. So if you want to see more of Jeff, definitely check out Bernie Blackout. Well, are you working on any uh, new movies now, Jeff, or any ideas? Yeah, or we've been trying to fundraise. I can't talk about the topics. Okay. But yeah. We want to take on corporatism. Our most recent movie, which, came out about a year and a half ago. Corporate coup d'etat? Yeah, the Cor corporate nice. coup d'etat. I just and watched we, it. Yeah, uh, I, we're really proud of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we are fundraising for a new movie, which will take on some corporate. And again, we're watching in the documentary movie business, the gates are, are shrinking. You know, the gates are not opening like they used to. Hmm. Uh, that it's harder and harder. That's why it's so great that Vice TV is running Pat McGee's movie here. Uh, because, you know, we're having some trouble getting funding and, you know, our movies are about what's wrong with U.S. politics. And we're huge in Germany and France and Japan. And, you know, our movies get huge ratings all over the world on public TV, but they can't be seen on allegedly public TV yeah. in the United States. That says all you no need to know about corporate media bias in the U.S., including on so-called public TV and public radio. Well, Jeff, I've kept you for Thanks, about an man. hour. I could talk to you forever, but um, yeah, and I, I recommend people check out Corporate Coup d'etat. I just watched it last night, really enjoyed and it. Fair .org. And fair.org. And fair, check out fair. Fair's great as well. And uh, wasn't there another, uh, I know you, you're, you're in a lot my, of projects. Yeah, my stuff is on jeffcohen.org, but the activist group that I worked with that is so closely allied with the Bernie movement is rootsaction.org. People know it. One word, rootsaction.org. Right, okay. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.